You're listening to the ADHD Support Talk Radio podcast. ADHD Support Talk is sponsored by addclasses.com. Visit www.addclasses.com to sign up for free webinars today. Hello and welcome back to ADHD Support Talk Radio. I'm your co-host, productivity and ADHD coach, Lynn Idris. I help smart, capable professionals accomplish more in less time by overcoming overwhelm, reducing procrastination, and improving time management so that they have more time, more energy, and even more money for what they love most. I'm a woman with ADD myself, so I've been where my clients are, and I've come out the other side, so to speak. So I know what it's like to live in that constant state of chaos and underperformance, but I also know what it's like to live a life full of success and fulfillment, and that's what I want for my clients, and that's what I want for each of you. You can learn more about me and the services and the programs I offer at www.coachingaddvantages.com. That's coaching advantages with two Ds, and you can text the keyword HACK, H-A-C-K, to 444-999, and I'll send you my seven foolproof productivity hacks today. In this episode, I'm going to talk about something that is really common for my clients to struggle with. It's something I hear a lot about, and this episode was sort of inspired by conversations I had with multiple clients today. This is a really prevalent, really common struggle for a lot of us who are adults with ADHD, and actually for children as well. And what I'm talking about is bedtime, sleep, and adult ADHD. The simplest thing that we can do to improve our ADHD challenges in general is to improve our self-care, to improve our nutrition, make sure we're getting exercise, to improve our stress management, to make sure we're getting plenty of regular and sufficient sleep. But simple doesn't always mean easy. And for a lot of us, this sleep piece can be a really big struggle and it can be a really big detriment to how we function. It's so hard for some of us just to go to bed to begin with. So there are lots of things that are behind our struggles with sleep. And if you're someone who struggles with sleep consistently, make sure you talk to your doctor to make sure there's not something medically going on behind your sleep struggles. I've had plenty of clients over the years who have had sleep issues, diagnosable you know, sleep conditions such as sleep apnea and other disturbances. And those things are important to get diagnosed. But if you're someone who's like most of us who are adults with ADHD, going to bed is a struggle, right? And I often hear my clients ask, you know, I don't understand why I can't just go to bed. I'm telling myself I need to go to bed. I'm telling myself I need to get enough sleep. I'm I'm having that conversation in my head. And the next thing I know, it's one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, whatever o'clock in the morning, and I've done it again. So why is it so hard to just go to bed? That's a great question, and it's one that clients ask me all the time, as I said. Honestly, if it were that easy, you'd already be doing it. We all know the vast majority of us need more sleep than we're actually getting. And this is something that I have struggled with for years, and it's something I really need to keep a very close eye on, or I can end up you know, going back down that rabbit hole myself. And I mean that not getting enough sleep rabbit hole. It happens really easily, and it happens really quickly for me something I have to really guard against. The reason we struggle with sleep is sort of tangly. It's like a lot of other things that we struggle with as adults with ADHD. I I often say these kinds of things are like a big pile of spaghetti that we're trying to untangle and trying to, you know, trying to find the right string to pull so we can unravel the, the big knot. First of all, we have wonky body clocks, right? We have difficulties with time blindness. We have difficulties with judging the flow of time, the passage of time, estimating what time it is. That's pretty typical ADD stuff. Again, we call that time blindness. It's it's our struggle with the perception of time and the perception of the flow of time. We also tend to be very sensitive to time changes. Um, Most of us are very sensitive to schedule, schedule changes, whether we realize it or not. Most of my clients, and I can really identify with this, Any kind of time change, daylight savings or travel through different time zones really messes us up. It it doesn't take a whole lot to really mess me up. My entire family makes fun of me on both ends of daylight savings time because it's not like when the clocks move forward, I get, you know, I'm, I'm an hour off in that direction. 
I'm like three hours off in both directions. So for weeks, I will say, why am I so tired? Oh, I'm so tired because it's really 10 o'clock or whatever. I play this game and I try to justify it, but the truth is it just really messes me up. Many of us also are night owls. We, and I am definitely a night owl. I am not a morning person. And this is, again, not universal. I have some clients who are morning people. I did not get that gene. I am not a morning person. I am a very slow waker upper, and I'm definitely better later at night than I am earlier in the morning. So we have, most of us have sort of messed up, or as I say, wonky senses of time or wonky body clock. And that can cause problems with, with the flow of time and with our our difficulty getting to bed. But there's also like a task management and productivity component that I I need to work on with a lot of my clients. For a lot of us, you know, we spend our days feeling like we're spinning around with one shoe nail to the floor, right? So you have very little to show for what you've accomplished in the day. You aren't as productive as you want to be. You don't get done the things that you intend to get done. So as the as the evening or as the night starts to wear on and you feel that pressure with the impending deadline, right, as the day draws to an end, you, you start to get a little bit stimulated. Your brain sort of wakes up and you feel that pressure to get stuff done. And for a lot of us, like with other things, you know, once we get started, we're in pretty good shape to keep going and it's hard to stop. That's a piece of it. So if you're not really on tra- on good track, if you don't really have good habits and good systems in place for task management, and if you're not on top of your productivity, sometimes that you know nighttime productivity can really get in your way. Uh, my husband used to call me like the midnight painter when my kids were little because when my kids would go to bed, I'd get real sleepy. And then as the evening wore on, I'd get sort of a second wind. And, it, and a lot of it was driven by the fact that I wasn't getting enough done during the day. So as the evening wore on and he would get groggier and I would be waking up and feeling that pressure of things that were undone, I'd start projects. And many, many nights, you know, I would stay up late as the kids are all in bed. And even if I had to get up early the next morning for work, you know, I'm painting the living room or or, or taking on some project that, that would keep me up, you know, till the wee hours of the night. The truth of the matter is, even if you're a night owl, you still need whatever sleep it is that you need. And that's going to be different for each one of us. And it's going to be different for each of us, depending on what's going in our, on in our lives. So if the task management productivity piece is part of what keeps you up at night, you know, take a look at your systems. Take a look to see if you have good systems in place to make sure that the things you need and intend to do are getting taken care of. Do you have good habits? Do you have good routines in place to make sure that the everyday sort of mundane stuff, the repetitive stuff gets done on autopilot? Do you have good systems for the rest of this stuff? Do those systems work for you? Are they built around your strengths and what comes naturally to you so that you can easily maintain them? Again, do you have good habits in place for working those systems? You know, if you have a a to-do list, a paper to-do list or a digital to-do list or whatever your task management system is, Do you have good habits in place for working that system, for making sure everything gets in it, for reviewing that system, for prioritizing and planning and and sort of reallocating or or reprioritizing periodically to ensure that everything gets done? Do you have good calendar management habits in place to make sure that the things on your calendar are being prepared for in advance? If you are ready to hit the hay and you're good and sleepy and you realize you have you know, and a meeting tomorrow that you've got to prepare for. And if you don't prepare for it tonight, it's not going to happen. You're about to jump down a very slippery slope and probably end up staying out much later than you need to. So all of those sort of task management, productivity kinds of systems can take a, have a big play or take a big toll on whether or not you're able to get to bed at a decent time. Most of us who have this kind of going to bed problem tend to be staying up past what I call the point of no return, right? So you get to a point in your in your evening where if you don't go to bed, you've gone so far down that sort of point of no return that it's too hard to turn yourself around. I often call this like the witching hour. There's a sweet spot for most of us, especially those of us who have this trouble with going to bed. So you've got to get yourself to bed in the sweet spot. Decision making is an ex- executive function function. So decision making, you know, as in I'm deciding to go to bed and I'm actually doing it, that's pretty heavy executive function stuff. 
planning that requires, you know, that foresight into the next day. If I don't go to bed now, A, B, C, D, and E are going to be a problem tomorrow. That's also a pretty executive function intensive activity. So expecting yourself to have that sort of executive function fuel or have that sort of executive function power late at night is is really not very realistic. So decision making, you know, making let's call them grown up or responsible decisions, that's a pretty executive function intensive activity. Expecting yourself to have self-control, make those kinds of decisions, have foresight, and be able to actually disengage from whatever it is that you're engaged in to separate and activate and go to bed is really tough when you have nothing left in your executive function fuel tank to help you make responsible decisions. So by the end of the night, you've done lots of thinking, lots of deciding, lots of processing, all of that stuff. And the the, the literal, I guess it's a figurative fuel tank in your brain, but literally the glucose in your brain gets burned up. And the later at night and the longer sort of that fuel tank goes empty, the harder it is to make those good decisions. So it, it is really important to see that you put yourself in that sort of sweet spot. You know, you avoid that witching hour. You don't go past that tipping point where you stay up past the point of no return and it makes it too hard for you to go to bed. So self-awareness is a big piece of that. Paying attention to when you feel groggy. Paying attention to when you need to start winding down. Paying attention to when it's important for you to start your evening routine, your kind of wind down, get yourself ready to bed, you know, all of those good sort of sleep hygiene kinds of things when you're when that needs to get started in the evening and having some sort of way to be reminded of that. That's really important. So that staying up past the point of no return thing is a big one for a lot of my clients. If you can catch yourself on the earlier side and start moving yourself in a better direction so you're not trying to make that hard decision you know, to go to bed or, or, or not go to bed when you really don't have very good decision-making power left can be really helpful. Then there's that sort of, and it's very similarly or very closely linked, what I call sort of the, the ADD fog. And, and it's when you're in sort of your, your comfort zone and it's, you're not in, a, in, not in a good way, right? So these are the kinds of habitual things you do that get you in trouble when it comes to going to bed. And again, it's it's when you have little decision making power. So you go into the quote, what I call the ADD fog, and you sort of start putting one foot in front of the other without having the mental wherewithal to make good decisions. It's kind of like the opposite of mindfulness, right? So you're not really being present. And I'll t- I'll give you some examples of this. And yours are going to be different than mine. And I hear different things from different clients as well. For a lot of us, being on on an electronic device, a phone, a tablet, you know, a, a laptop, whatever is really tricky here. This is an easy way to go into the ADD fog. It can be almost like you climbed into your phone, right? So you get in that comfortable sort of position, you get in that sort of fog, you get in that comfort zone where you're not really fully present and you're just kind of zoning out with with the device. That's a tough one. For me, and I've heard other clients say this as well, there are certain places that I don't want to sit at night because I know I'm going to get myself in trouble. If I sit down in my office chair before I go to bed, I'm guaranteed to be up later than I than I intend to be. So if I have to check something on my computer or, you know, take one last peek at my calendar or, or, you know, whatever, make sure an email didn't come in, I'm going to stand and do it. If I sit down in that chair, I get into sort of that zone. I go into that ADD fog and it's much too hard for me to make good decisions. You can have the same thing happen in the morning. That's a whole other conversation. But pay attention to what your danger zones are. Pay attention to what sends you into that fog or what sends you into that sort of mindless, you know, sort of numb brain, difficult decision making sort of a pattern and and pay attention. I mean, sometimes it's buzzing around the kitchen. I've heard some clients say I'm fine until I start to, you know, do the last minute tidying up downstairs. And the next thing I know, I'm folding laundry and all kinds of time has gone by. For some clients, it's, you know, one more Netflix movie, one more YouTube video, you know, you've got to pay attention to what your danger zones are and what your slippery slopes are. What are the kinds of things that send you into that ADD fog that you find have a hard time pulling yourself out of? So it's really all about self-awareness and objection, objective problem solving. And you've got to untangle those factors for yourself. 
You've got to really look at what's getting in your way. Try to step back from it. Try to stop beating yourself up because that's probably the very worst thing you can do. And most of us do do that. You know, I did it again. I had every intention. I said I was going to go to bed. I said I was going to get more sleep. And here we go again. I'm on my third night or, you know, whatever. And I'm still not getting enough rest. I had a client tell me she got two hours of sleep last night. And she didn't, had no idea how it happened. Checked something on her phone when she was laying down in bed. Next thing you knew, you know, she knew it. hours and hours and hours had passed by. And I had another client today told me she was up until the, she started to see the sun peek over the horizon because she got sucked into a good book. It happens easily. It happens to all of us. And when you really start beating yourself up and feeling horrible about it and really going into that blame and shame mindset, you're not helping yourself untangle the factors, improve your self-awareness, and try to make changes in the future. You're really doing yourself more of a disservice, and you're making it more likely to happen again. And then, of course, you know, anything we struggle with, we want to put external supports in place that can help us. We want to use alarms. We want to use reminders. I had a client who was, it would get himself in trouble late night, you know, with YouTube and Netflix and you know, really anything digital, once the whole family had gone to bed, you know, I know that feeling, the hush falls over the house. And it's almost like you don't want to go to bed because you don't want the quiet and the peace and the calm and sort of the clarity that you have in your mind to end. So he had to do a series of alarms, like literal alarm clocks, not just phone apps that he could quickly dismiss. But he put an alarm clock outside of his children's bedroom that would go off every evening. He put one near the bottom of the steps that was kind of like the warning shot, right? So he had to get up, separate from what he was doing and physically turn that alarm clock off at the bottom of the steps so he didn't wake his wife up. Her room was at the top of the steps. Down the hall was the one that was right outside of the kid's room. And so if that one goes off, he's really in big trouble, right? (laughs) He's waking up the little kids. He's waking up his wife. And, you know, it's not so much about him being in trouble, but that's not the dad he wants to be, right? So he had to put some external supports in place that helped him disengage. Phone alarms can be great. Timers can be great. You know, but sometimes we have to get a little bit firmer with ourselves. We have to find things that are a little harder for us to dismiss or a little bit harder for us to ignore. I'm a big fan of of the loud, obnoxious timers at night. I'm going to have a warning timer that goes off and gives me sort of the advance warning to stop what I'm doing, wrap up, transition, you know, if I'm writing or something like that, make some notes of where I am and where I want to be to pick back up. That's after my, my warning timer goes off. And then, you know, I've got to transition out, get up, move over and turn that other one off before I wake up the whole house or before I jar myself. Even if there's no one else to wake up, I don't want to hear the obnoxious timer. That obnoxious timer, I call my drop dead timer. That's definitely one that helps me get to bed at a decent time. So I know it's something that a lot of us struggle with. I hope you're not beating yourself up about it too badly, but know that it's an important thing to get a handle on. When you do get a handle and you're getting more sleep consistently, it's amazing what a rested brain can do for your ADD challenges. It's amazing how much easier your your attention is to regulate, your decision making is, how much better your executive functions work when you're getting regular and sufficient sleep and you're really taking care of yourself. So give it some thought, try to untangle those threads for yourself. Think about it, do a little sort of postmortem next time you find yourself up too late or you find yourself, you know, struggling to go to bed and notice what kinds of things are your slippery slopes? What kinds of things send you into ADD fog and what kinds of things keep you up later than you intend them to? Hope you find something in here helpful. Again, I'm Coach Lynn Idris. You're listening to ADHD Support Talk Radio. I hope you'll join us again soon and check out my website again, www.coachingaddvantages.com. Thanks for your attention.